Welcome to day 18 of the 50 Days to Your Pentecost. I'm Michael Pierce. And I'm Ann Pierce. And we are living and walking in the Spirit in this 50-day journey of faith. Today, our, our wonderful guest, good friend, uh, Kimberly Swaim from St. Louis uh, in, in the beautiful nation of the United States is going to be with us. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to have a, a young guy, uh, a millennial from right here in Calgary, uh, Justin Menzi will be with us, and he's going to be sharing about the journey of his life and and how he has found a way to walk with God. And then on Friday, uh, a great friend from Germany, Uwe uh, Meyer, will be with us, and and he is he is a, a man of deep deep conviction, really waiting on the Lord and waiting on the Lord in worship, whether that worship is reading, praying, walking. Or, or in song. So you won't want to miss Uve. And then finally on Saturday, Imad Hamati from Amman, Jordan. Uh, you will not want to miss uh, Imad. He has got so much life and so much hope. So as people are jumping on, uh, we just want to welcome Kimberly to the screen. It's so good to have you here, Kimberly. Kimberly is uh, uh, a life coach. She is uh, the founder of The Realigned Life whose mission is to create a safe place for women uh, to rest, reflect, grow, and realign with God so that joy and purpose and identity are restored to them. It's great to have you here uh, today, Kimberly. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And, you know, before I forget, she's a, a wife, a mom of four, and uh, gets to travel all over the place because her kids are involved in competitive activities of sport nature. <laughs> yes. My children love to wrestle, which, I mean, talk about an intense sport. They, they are hands-on people. <laughs> That's right. And you've lived all over the world yes. uh, because, because your husband's uh, occupation is the same kind of occupation that you grew up in. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how how the world has become your home? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a family. My dad was a United States Marine officer, and we traveled the world. Um, I lived in Japan when I was a little girl, and North Carolina, Ohio. I mean, we lived everywhere. Um, and then I got married, and my husband decided to go into the Marine Corps as well. Um, and so we traveled the world even more and we spent a lot of time, um, here in the United States, everywhere from coast to coast, but then also, um, over in Germany. So I thought I had lived abroad and then I moved abroad again. We put our kids in German school cause you know, yeah. when in Rome, do as the Romans, when in Germany, do as the Germans. So we, um, pushed them into school and allowed them to experience the culture and learn the language, which meant mom had to experience the culture and learn the language, um, which then brought some beautiful bridges for me to be able to go back and forth, which was where I've been the last two weeks. So um, got to spend yeah. some time there with you guys last year, um, which was amazing. I missed you guys this year, but you were here doing your thing. Um, and God had me out doing mine. So I'm glad to be back home with you guys. So, so it sounded to me like, um, it was, it was a wonderful thing for you to suggest to the kids, you need to learn German and you need to learn culture, mm. but it didn't sound to me like you might've been as exo excited about that for yourself. It, 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 was I missing something there? I mean. I love culture and I love people, but learning German is very difficult. And yeah, um, yeah, I am. I struggle with dyslexia, and so uh, learning a very hard language was a very guttural, a very um, in your throat kind of language. Yes, and everybody kind of sounds like they're angry. Yeah. But now that I've learned the language and also the culture, it's like no, they're. It's just a very different sounding language than I, I remember the same having the same feeling when I was first with Arabic friends. Oh, yeah. um, and and they're always very, very it feels to our culture aggressive, but they're just so exuberant and passionate about what they're talking about. They express it in a way that's wonderful. So in the midst of being in Germany, 
Uh, you also ended up being able to find calm in the midst of the chaos. And you ended up writing a book by that type, by that title, Finding Calm in the Midst of the Chaos. And it was a journey of personal uh, finding and personal re restoration. Today, I find it very interesting that this title, Finding Calm in the Midst of the Chaos, would be something that probably every individual in the Western world, if not in the world, would be longing for, mm -hmm. is, is the, the uncertainty of, of our world today, and, and increasingly so day by day, it would seem this need for calm, this need for rest, this need for how do I, you, you know, we, we were talking about working so hard to be a good Christian and ending up burning out. Yeah. I Touch mean, on that. So I think, I mean, now that you know my background of military service as a dependent in every aspect, right? Um, I was raised also to believe that we are warriors for Christ and we are in God's army. And so it's the regimented, like, keep moving, keep going, keep pushing, keep fighting. Um, similar to a, if you guys seen the Disney movie, Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, which to me, I was a swimmer all the way through college. So that really resonated with me. Just keep swimming, just keep moving forward, just keep going. It will yeah. get better. Do, do, do until I was in Germany and I was doing so much that I found myself burnt out. Yeah. Um, we went through a family crisis. Uh, my husband uh, was invited to become free of a private addiction and I was totally blindsided. Um, and my children and I just really, we were left in a little bit of chaos um, as my husband unraveled a lot of um, family trauma and hurt and wounding. Um, and then I had to figure out how I was going to deal with the wounding of what was happening to me in those moments, mm -hmm. already exhausted from an overseas move and, yeah. um, you know, putting kids in a, a school, you can't speak the language and into all of the learning that was going on. Um, all of a sudden I went from doing to absolutely nothing. Yeah. Like it, literally it, can't get out of my environment in my, my house. Yeah. That's hard. Really hard. And, and it seems that, uh, for believers who are striving to be Christ-like, yeah. to admit that your your personal life, um, you know, the closet is the is the place you don't want anybody to see because <laughs> it's a mess, right? right? And yeah. I have permission for the closet, but the closet ends up controlling every part of my life. Yeah, and and so so this this aspect of of the shame that that we end up having as people who have faith. And, and it's a paradox. We, we wonder, how am I supposed to be this, you know, this good person, this, this Christian who is overcoming, who is, who is always on top. And I wonder if, if we've missed the mark on how we gain these scriptural, powerful pr uh, promises, how we gain them as a part of our inner being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel, Michael, you're really tapping into something in my heart where it was, you know, keep that closet door closed. Keep it closed and keep moving because it'll go away eventually. Right. And God was like, actually, I want to let that out so you don't have to carry it alone mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. And so when my husband was able to speak about what was going on in his heart, I looked at him and I'm like, I can't keep this quiet. I have to talk about this. And I, I mean, I spoke to counselors and, and coaches yeah. and, you know, appropriately uh, as much as possible. Um, clearly didn't do everything in alignment with the Lord, which is why he's realigning everything. Um, but I, I wasn't going to be able to handle it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and and my husband was like, yeah, I mean, we, we have to get help. And so we got the help and we sought um, people, but 
in that time also, God was really pulling me back to the roots of abiding and rest. Mm. One of the counselors that I spoke to, who was actually a friend of mine, she couldn't be my counselor. um, And she said to me, Kim, I really feel like you just need to learn to float. Mm. And I was like, as a swimmer, that means something to me. But as a human being who was told to just keep moving in that regimented militant way, what did that look like? Yeah. As a mom of four, as a wife living abroad, you know, like nobody was showing up on my doorstep with crock pots full of food. Like that wasn't the case because there was no accident. Yeah. You know, there was no trauma on the outside as far as people could see. What was happening was internal. Yeah. Correct. The doors were bursting open and God was saying, rest here with me in this. Hmm. And the the book that came out of it was from journal entries that God was writing in my storyline to learn to rest and what what fruits that would bring. Hmm. I had no idea in that season six years ago, but you know now I, total shift to you know we were talking. I, we just got home from Germany. What was I doing in Germany? I was hosting a retreat with 16 women in a castle on a hill (laughs) in the upper room revealing some of our innermost secrets where we could rest with one another we could encourage one another we weren't judging or comparing our stories but it was a place of like oh i i have so much empathy to you because i've had hard also doesn't look the same. It's not the same details, but I get it. And just having a place to share our stories yeah. and find healing with one another. You, you know, the up the upper room. Uh, we we again have this 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 religious veneer thought of what it would have been like. Um, mm-hmm. But but the disciples that were there, uh, as many as five hundred were there. Uh, and and on the day of Pentecost, there was 120. But these people were wrestling through disappointment, discouragement, maybe even thoughts of betrayal because, you know, Peter had, you know, said, I will never forsake you, Lord, and then yeah. went right about mm-hmm. doing that. And and there's a Peter in each of us. Yeah. There, there is. And, and so so this this idea of the upper room being a place to share. It's not a place to, to revisit and continue being a victim. Right. But, but it, it's, it's about a healthy place to share the heart, for the heart to receive healing so that you can go forward. Absolutely. I mean, and not having the burden of healing someone else's woundings, learning to just be able to be comfortable listening to the story and knowing that God will show up for them just like he's showing up for me. Mm. You know, Mm. that was a big thing too, as a coach, as a counselor, as a, an an empath, like I want to wrap my arms around someone and have the right words or have the right bandaid or ointment. And it's really only God that can soothe them and put the salve on them to move them forward. And, and don't you yeah. think even with uh, Jesus coming to Mary and Martha when Lazarus died, it says he wept, like he showed up, right? And, you know, the heart cry was, oh, master, if you'd have showed up, my brother wouldn't have died. Yeah. But it's so good that, you know, when you see that example of Jesus where he's saying, hey, I'm here. And what does it say right after? It says, and Jesus wept. He was willing to show up with his tears. Sometimes we want to show up and fix it. <laughs> well, yeah, because that's, that's you know, we have to be strong. That's we- the Band-Aid you're talking about. Right, right. And I really often feel like times where, you know, we accidentally, we give somebody a Kleenex or we give them a pat on the back or we, like, it's because we're not comfortable with their emotion. Exactly. Yeah. And I have a lot of emotion. Anne and Michael know that very well with me. Like, man, they have counseled and mentored my husband and I through the thickest of moments. And they know I'm emotional. And 
that is also one of my positive traits is that I'm not afraid of emotion. Mm. I can sit with people in their deepest emotion because I feel deeply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Jesus also felt deeply. And I love Second Corinthians chapter one. It talks about, I believe it's Second Corinthians, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it talks about those who have had to have much comfort are able to comfort others. Yeah. Because yeah. you've needed it. And man, I've needed comfort along the way. And and we we don't know the what our pain can be until we come into that place of calm, that place of peace, that place of safety, so that in fact, it's no longer a point of shame, but that wound that's healed is now uh, a sign to those that we come in contact with, this one will understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't like, we don't like weakness in, in, a, in a disciplined military life you do not have weakness there's no room for it no you know especially i mean and i i can speak to the heart of many many wounded warriors in this moment where it's like you are now benched you are now set apart you're set aside Mm -hmm. and we're just going to keep moving on without you yes and that's not the heart of the father the heart of the father is I'm going to put you on the bench. I'm going to sit you out and I'm going to sit right next to you. Yeah. I'm going to heal you and I'm going to work with you and I'm going to be with you and I'm going to love you until we can get back into the fight. And that fight might look totally different because now you know how to fight from rest. Yes. 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 Because being benched is not about being um, scolded. Disqualified. Disqualified. Because I think when we think of being benched, we think, especially here in Canada, we think of being benched when you're a hockey player or yes. you're benched yes. when you're a basketball player, right? Or a soccer you're player, foosball, yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you get benched, then you feel that shame that the coach is actually against you. Right. He benched you and he put somebody out in your place. Well, I, love that, your father. I love that you use hockey as an example because I was just, I moved, I went from Germany straight to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to meet up with our son who's in college and he is getting an award uh, for being an honorary, like exemplary military service member. So he is also now going into the Marine Corps and he had gotten some awards and I wanted to be there. And then we went to a Pittsburgh Penguins game because that's okay. what we do when we're in Pittsburgh and we're watching the hockey game. There is a regiment. They play for one minute and they play really hard and then they're benched yeah. and then next line goes in. There's, there is a cycle that they play from because if you're over, if you're out there too, too much longer, you're not as great. You're not as fast. You make mistakes. You get winded. You're not playing as well. So they bring you back in and bench you not because you're in trouble, but because that's part of the cycle. I mean, Shabbat, it's, it's, right? it's, 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 yeah, the Shabbat and it's, and it's a part of the, the family or the mm-hmm. team. Uh, many times team sports, become a second family to participants. And, and I, wanna, I want us to now, we, we've, we've gone all the way around this, this incredible topic. Let's bring up today's scriptures because I think that they just dovetail in yeah. such a powerful, powerful way. Go ahead and read the first one, honey. Come to me, all you are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm-hmm. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. And and in John fifteen seven and eight, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. By this, this is so good. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. We we were talking about this a little bit before we came on the broadcast, and and Kim, you were just saying that uh, this is something that's just burning in your heart. This idea of bearing much fruit, but being a mm-hmm. disciple. Go ahead and just share your thoughts on that, uh, Kimberly. 
Well, I really, I mean, I've been studying these scriptures for several days as I'm just coming into this, um, this talk this morning. And the thing that really rested on me strongly was in order to be called the disciple that bears much fruit, you must rest and abide in him. Like if it's not go do all these great things and keep working and working and working so that you can bear fruit. It's called rest in me, abide in me, live in me. Hmm. And then you will glorify me and bear much fruit. You know, I, I remember having a picture years ago um, where, where I saw a tree uh, trying to strain and grunt and groan uh, to be nurtured and to grow. But in fact, the very nature of the tree is that it will draw up the nutrients from the ground in the root and then the whole the whole tree is is actually strengthened and that's how it bears fruit the other side of the bearing of much fruit is also the fact that we end up being pruned now i yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had that's, to bring that up, didn't I? <laughs> it's the cutting and the burning and the because the passage right before um in John, the the verse is, or you will be cut off from me. Yeah. And then burned. So yeah. the parts that no longer serve a purpose or where we're being led astray, or we might have been growing in one area, but God wants to grow us deeper. He's going to cut that part off. Yeah. And he's going to burn it so we don't go back to it. And, and this burning... Um, it is not again of judgment, yeah. no. but it, it is so that we will not go back mm -hmm. to a way that we, we we lived before. It's like he's cutting it off between soul and spirit. He's taking the sword of the spirit to remove that, to separate it from us, so that we we are able to move forward in Him in a way that we could have never moved before. So Kimberly, talk, talk to us about how in the middle of, of stretch, in the middle of pain, in the middle of the Lord pruning, in the middle of still sorrow, how did the Lord use this to actually draw you so that all things that work together from Philippians, all things work together for yeah. good, who, the, who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, the word sure doesn't say all things are good. So not everything was good, but in it, he turned all things to good. And out of it, you wrote a book. And then he actually allowed you to start to have a passion for women. So he took the pain, he used it, and you actually now are speaking and mm -hmm. doing um, coaching. And you're actually doing retreats to be able to sit with people in the middle of their pain. So you went from one who had pain yeah. to be able to actually sit with people who are in their pain. Well, I think there's a maturing process that goes on in that season. And for me, um, I had often gotten lost in the woods with other women who were, we'd go for walks or we'd go for coffee. And I didn't know how to handle their hurt because I had never been taught how to handle my own. And so in this season with the Lord, where it was like, I don't, I, I have to rest in you. I, I don't know what to do. And he was teaching me to draw in, draw in further, come in further, like literally to the point where we moved from Germany to Rhode Island. And I told my children, if my bedroom door is closed and then my closet door is closed, that means don't open it because mom is resting and I needed to like have headphones on and have a ma eye mask on. So I could be in that quiet, quiet space and recalibrate. And so I was learning tools and techniques that would work for me. Um, learning that when I was tired, my, my sensitivities were up and, and that my emotion was higher. And like even the food that I was intaking mm. affected my personality. And if I wasn't getting enough sleep or if I wasn't getting exercise, like, really just paying attention to my own needs, then I could recognize, okay, I got sleep. I'm eating healthy. I'm getting some exercise. I'm getting fresh air, you know, and then being able to walk healthier in my own family 
and starting a, a new regimen that started in that place of rest in darkness and quiet um, and listening to my own body's needs, my mm. own inside, my own intuition of, wait, what do I need? That's where it starts from. Yeah. And then allowing that to set the boundary for my children, you mm. know, like, no, you don't get to just walk in at any point and start dumping on me. It was so awesome because before I left for my Germany retreat, this go round, um, my 15 year old daughter who will be 16 in a week Woo! comes to me and she says, mom, I want to ask you a question. Um, I have an idea. Are you at a place where you can handle something new? <laughs> and just the way she asked it was so mature because we've walked out don't just come and dump on me. Right. You know, I'm not a garbage can. And so just her knowing that I was in a season of preparing for this retreat, maybe not springing a new idea on mom would be a bad, you know, good or bad idea. Mm -hmm. And then she gave me the space to think about it at 15. And I said, is it positive idea or a negative? And she's like, <laughs> oh. she goes, I think it's going to be positive for you. And I was like, okay, then I can handle it. Let's, let's chat. And she presented an idea that was so beautiful. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. Yes, I've been waiting for you to ask me that. Um, and it was just this looking back six years ago, if mm -hmm. I would not have gone through what I went through, yeah, I wouldn't have a 15-year-old daughter who is able to ask me, hey, mom, are you capable of handling a new idea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Instead, good. Instead, she would just be you know, a normal 15 year old who's just like, it's all about me and not about mom's feelings at all. Um, so and, and, dare, and dare I say, dare I say, you know, the maturing process is not an overnight process. Oh, heavens. And it's so six years plus the many, many before that. <laughs> and, and so, and, and for some folks, uh, you might feel right now, uh, your personal situation, uh, there isn't a door to close where you're able to be by your, yourself. And I remember back in the 90s when, when Anne and I would be a part of the uh, Toronto Blessing, uh, we actually learned how to be able to stay focused in the Lord in the midst of chaos all the way around us. And, and so for some of you, uh, you're able to, to receive exactly what Kimberly is saying. And, and you realize that this is something you need to do and for others, you might feel, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the door closed because there's not a door on any room in my home or any room in my life. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that the Father is not leaving you out. Mm -hmm. He's saying, come to me. Yeah. Come to me. All of you who have been working so hard, all of you who have been trying so diligently. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of on the airplane. You know, they say if we hit a bump and the oxygen masks come down, Put your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. And so, Kim, you were learning to put that oxygen mask on, taking that space. And so I just I just want to speak to those who feel like, well, that's a shame. Like, I need to be fixing this. I need to be mm -hmm. running and doing this. No, allow that calm, that burden where he says, come to me, all you are weak and weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah. Take yeah. his rest first. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can go and try to be his hands, to be his feet, be his ears to mm -hmm. those around you. But put your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. And I just I, I think that's probably a great place to like wrap that up for me is Yahweh. It means breath of life. Mm -hmm. So putting wow. that oxygen back into our lungs. And I used to do this breath prayer where I'd be like, breathe in peace and breathe out, you know, anxiety, breathe in calm and breathe out fear. And I kind of just leave it at that until I realized you just keep breathing until you're breathing in peace and breathing out peace. Mm -hmm. Wow. You want to be atmosphere changers. Yes. So what good. can we change? We can change our breath. Yeah. our breath and connect it to Christ and Christ alone. And so as we, um, as we wrap things up, I'm watching the time I'm being diligent, but um, I just want to bless this audience. I just want yeah. to bless all of you in the name of Yahweh, 
breath of life, that we can just breathe him in at any moment, wherever we are, Mm -hmm. when it feels chaotic and we want to hold our breath or we're hyperventilating and our breath is quick and rapid. No, slow it down and breathe deeper, breathe more deeply in Yahweh, the breath of life, Mm -hmm. because we have the ability to breathe. If we are alive, we are breathing. Therefore, breathe the depth of God, our Father, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King, Holy Spirit that resides in us. Just breathe. Breathe in His peace until you feel the release in your body and release that peace out into the room of the loved ones that are around you or maybe the people that need the peace the most, you can be an atmosphere changer just by breathing. And that is true. Yeah. And, you know, um, for some, you're thinking, but I'm hyperventilating. Life is out of control. But Jesus gives you the choice. Trust me in this moment. Yes. And so we do. We breathe in Yahweh. Mm Mm-hmm. We abide in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And as as we uh, conclude today, um, we just want to thank you, Kimberly, Mm -hmm. you know, for for the journey that we've been able to walk with you and and the whole family. Uh, You know, uh, uh, we ended up at your house uh, in St. Louis when you moved from the East Coast. Uh, you actually really? beat us here and prayed on our land before we could even get the keys. What a godsend you guys have been to us. <laughs> so, so we bless you all. And let's make sure, folks, uh, to, to come to him, to breathe him in, and to know that he will meet us where we are and bring us to a better place. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, we're going to have Justin Menzi with us, uh, a millennial from here in Calgary. Uh, just an incredible journey that he's been on. And please, if you've enjoyed today, share the broadcast with your friends, like us on Facebook and YouTube, and subscribe so that you know who's going to be on and when. Until tomorrow, we bless you. We love you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.